All righty. So we talked a lot about single family. Now we're going to move into multifamily. So I'll be talking about multifamily electrification. I'll be presenting on a few case studies. Ultimately, multifamily buildings, they're, they are a snowflake. Um, each one is individual and unique. And so really the best way to sort of illustrate the challenges uh, associated specific to multifamily I found was shared through case studies and real examples. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so quick agenda. I'm gonna go through some multifamily electrical infrastructure, how it differs from single family, and then go into case studies. We have a high rise example where we're avoiding a service upgrade. And then we have a low rise example where we're avoiding a sub panel upgrade. All of these examples um, we are going through are utilizing low amperage, low voltage equipment that was presented in the previous, uh, from the previous presenters. Uh, we're also going to be utilizing some sort of like NEC code exceptions and options and alternatives to avoiding the uh, costly electrical upgrades. So next slide. So uh, this is a diagram of a typical multifamily electrical infrastructure uh, setup. Now I say typical, and I mentioned that all multifamily buildings are different. This is probably 51%, the majority, but not the vast majority of multifamily buildings. And so we have the utility uh, power lines coming in from the left. We have our service disconnect, and then that splits off to individual uh, dwelling unit meters and house meters. And then we have our main disconnects for those dwelling unit and house um, loads. And we have our load centers, our sub panels, and then all the way over to the right, we have our circuits. Now, uh, what differs here and what sort of adds complication is that the utility power line is owned by the utility, of course. The service disconnect is owned by the property owner. The meters are owned by the utility. And then the dwelling unit uh, disconnects and house main disconnects are owned by the property owner. So you can imagine, you know, all, a lot of coordination here if you have to upgrade uh, not only the sub panels, but also the um, sort of the, the things that are in that box there, the, all of the switch gear uh, coordination with the utility can add a lot of time, a lot of cost. So trying to avoid that is advantageous, of course, for electrified multifamily buildings. Next slide, please. So a lot of this variety in multifamily building electrical infrastructure is directly related to the metering type. So we have three sort of standard metering types that we have in multifamily. We have master metered, which is most like a single family home where you have your utility power coming in, you have your meter, and then you have your service disconnect. And there's a really great uh, delineation between utility owned equipment and owner owned equipment. Then we have direct metered where uh, that's sort of the most typical example of multifamily buildings. And that was that setup was shared in the previous slide. And then we have a hybrid of the two. Uh, we have sub metered where you have a main disconnect, but also separate sub meters for the different end uses or different dwelling units. Now, um, in multifamily, you know, within these different types of metering, uh, we also have variation based off building size, uh, number of buildings, uh, the year the property was built. So within this, we have another sort of layer of variability in multifamily. Next slide, please. So jumping into the case studies here, uh, the first case study we're gonna present on or I'm gonna present on is a high rise full electrification project located in Santa Ana, California, built in 1984. It's 11 stories, 199 apartments, central gas, domestic hot water, and it has a two pipe heating and cooling system. So essentially what that is, is they have a chiller cooling water for that's going to be circulated throughout the building to provide space conditioning or air conditioning. And then we have a gas boiler that's heating water to uh, provide space heating in the dwelling units and in the common areas. Now, this property has limited electrical capacity and it is master meter. The scope of work included a reversible chiller. So we were going to uh, what we did was we took that gas boiler that provided space heating. We removed it. We took that chiller that provided space conditioning through cooled water. We removed that and installed a central reversible chiller, which is a heat pump chiller that provides heating and cooling. So it can heat the water and it can cool the water. And then uh, we also installed a central heat pump water heater for domestic hot water. And at this site, uh, we're looking at you know all central equipment and we're able to achieve full electrification by doing those sort of two measures. Next slide, please. 
So uh, Tom touched on this a bit, but the NEC 280.7 has a, uh, sorry, 220.7 uh, has a um, alternative approach to calculating the load. And ultimately this is utilizing uh, load monitoring or the existing load to determine your available electrical capacity as well as your existing electrical load. So uh, it utilizes actual demand rather than calculated demand to determine existing electrical load and available electrical capacity. Uh, is often much more favorable results compared to the calculated demand slash load analysis. So if you're not familiar with the NEC, the standard approach is to tally up all of the electrical end uses, apply demand factors to those, and you come out with a uh, calculated electrical load that then results in your required electrical capacity. Now, this option allows you in existing buildings to uh, monitor the electrical load of, or the existing electrical load. And that is your basis of your existing load and then your available electrical capacity for uh, electrification. So I'm gonna walk through an example of utilizing this in a field in a real project to achieve full electrification. Next slide, please. So uh, in this project, we use the max demand uh, load calculation approach. We uh, looked at 12 months of bills. so. You can actually install load monitoring equipment, or if you have access to peak kilowatt draw or demand charges, um, depending on your rate, you can actually utilize utility bills to determine what your peak load is if you have a year's worth. So that's what we did in this site here. We had we reviewed 12 months of utility bills. What we found was the peak draw at the property was 218 kilowatts during the summer. And on the right, we took that 218 kilowatts, we converted it to KVA utilizing an assumed power factor. And then we had the NEC 220.87 is the uh, sort of monitoring option here. And in that code section, you have to apply a 25% safety factor to whatever KVA value you measured. And what we found was that uh, we had 946 amps of load on an existing service of 1200 amps with 254 amps of available capacity. Now, with the existing load at the site, and this is something that we see in multifamily quite often, is if we did a deemed load calculation, what we'd probably find is that the existing electrical capacity doesn't support the existing load. But utilizing this uh, approach, we were able to see that we had 254 amps of available capacity. Next slide, please. And so uh, taking those 254 amps, can we electrify the water heating? Can we electrify the space heating and space conditioning at the site? Uh, well, the answer to that was no at first. So we installed, we looked at the load calculations, adding a new central heat pump water heater. And what we found was that adding that new central heat pump water heater plant to that existing load was gonna result in 1,280 amps of required service. And with a service of only 1,200 amps, we were going down the route of triggering a service upgrade. And Emily mentioned this previously, where in multifamily, you know, we're working with a lot of power here. And so triggering a service upgrade for a 199 unit building is almost certainly going to trigger transformer upgrades and costly utility side upgrades that the owner that's going to be on the owner's cost. So we're really trying to avoid that, right? Next slide, please. So we took another pass at the calculation, and this time, what we did was we removed the existing loads that we were removing from the site. So starting off on the right, you see we removed that boiler HVAC load since we're removing that hydronic heating boiler. That only removed uh, 1.2 kVA, but really where a lot of our uh, savings or a lot of our uh, electrical infrastructure or electrical load savings came from upgrading the, the chiller. So by adding in a new chiller, a reversible chiller, um, a heat pump chiller, a more efficient chiller, we we're actually going to save 36 kVA. And what that resulted in is us just fitting below the uh, 1200 amp service. So we have 1180 1, amps load with all of the new electric equipment, and we're just below that existing service size. So other upgrades that could be potential here at the site. LED lighting retrofit. So if we upgraded all of the lighting to be more aggressive, more efficient, that's going to lower our KVA. Um, ventilation upgrades going from belt-driven fans to direct drive fans, maybe some additional controls there can also help. Um, but ultimately, 
if you take anything from this case study, it is that utilizing NEC 220.87 and actually taking what the existing load is and not the calculated load to determine your available electrical capacity in um, to electrify is going to result in much more favorable results. And it's going to make it much more achievable with uh, much more achievable to complete full electrification at the site. And, uh, you know, you, you want to take advantage of those other options as well of like, um, you know, smart panels, smart breakers, and, you know, low voltage, low amperage equipment. But this is another option uh, to sort of in your tool belt of options to avoid panel upgrades of using this uh, 220.87 NEC uh, section. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna move over to the low rise full electrification project. And in this project, uh, the challenges were in the actual dwelling units, not in the service size. So a little bit different approach here. Uh, property was in, is in Sunnyvale, California, built in 1994. Three stories, 121 SRO apartments, one on-site manager apartment. We have a central combi gas boiler providing domestic hot water and space heating. So very similar system to the previous, except we have one water heating plant serving domestic hot water and space heating, circulating hot water throughout the property. On the right, you see that photo. Top right, you see a photo of like a vent. In there is an air handler unit where hot water is going through that air handler and air is passing over that hot water, providing heating to the unit. Uh, we had limited electrical capacity at the site. This site is also master metered. The units do not have their own kitchen, which is very important as you'll see later on in the in the case study, and then the scope of work included in-unit HVAC electrification with packed thermal heat pumps. So we we're removing central heating and going into in-unit individual packaged thermal heat pumps. And one of the main reasons for that was by going with a packaged thermal heat pump, the units are so small, we're able to go with 120 volt, 15 amp, really low voltage, low amperage packaged thermal heat pump. And then on the central side, we uh, installed a central heat pump water heater for domestic hot water. And then on the photo on the right, you see that electric resistance um, uh, range that was in the community spaces at the property. So we had sort of community kitchens as well. Next slide. So this is a single line diagram from the actual building plans. And you can see this is more similar to what a single family uh, electrical infrastructure setup looks like. We have the service coming in. First step is a meter. Then we have our 1600 amp service disconnect. And then it spreads out to all of these individual sub panels. Now um, there are 122 units at this site and not that many sub panels. We do not have a sub panel for each indi individual dwelling unit. We have sub panels in the hallway serving multiple dwelling units. Next slide, please. And so in this case, this is the panel schedule from one of the sub panels that are in the hallway. Uh, we do not have any space on this panel for additional circuits. Uh, what's highlighted in red is a single dwelling units uh, circuit. So we have a microwave and fridge circuit. We have a small appliance circuit. We have receptacle and lights. And then on the bottom right, we have a garbage disposal circuit as well. So every unit only has four circuits. And we do not have available circuits for a packaged thermal heat pump. And you know, triggering these panel upgrades are going to be significant uh, at a significant cost to the project. Next slide, please. So uh, this is some more detail about the existing circuits in each dwelling unit. We have a microwave mini fridge, lighting receptacle, small appliance, garbage disposal, no available circuit for packaged thermal heat pumps. And you can see the microwave, the garbage disposal, the mini fridge. And then you start to see like a standard unit layout there. Now, the NEC requires two small appliance circuits for dwelling units. And in this case, that is our microwave slash mini fridge and our small appliance circuit. Now, because there is no existing kitchen here, we're actually not required to provide two small appliance circuits. And so we we're actually able to reuse that small appliance circuit for the package terminal heat pump because of that sort of exception in the code because we do not have uh, kitchens in these dwelling units, they're not considered a dwelling unit by the electrical code. So we're able to utilize that small appliance circuit for the package thermal heat pump. Next slide, please. So uh, we surface mounted the conduit. You can see that on the left, we ran it from, uh, we ran that circuit from the kitchen over to the uh, exterior wall where we installed a 
uh, package terminal heat pump. Again, 120 volts, uh, 15 amp low amperage package terminal heat pump wasn't going to trigger any sort of upstream upgrades. We just needed to find a circuit to land for this uh, HVAC unit. So we're able to utilize that small appliance circuit um, and get away with electrifying the HVAC without any major electrical upgrades. Next slide, please. So um, although we're taking away that small appliance circuit, which is that receptacle on the right in, in that diagram there, and residents don't have cooking at the site in, the, in their units, they also utilize that circuit all the time, right? If we're gonna take that receptacle, where are they gonna plug in their coffee makers, their uh, countertop stoves, their uh, toasters, their countertop ovens, they all have cooking equipment that are utilizing the small appliance circuit. So the plan, it, the plan was to pull power from the uh, circuit below, which is the mini fridge microwave uh, circuit, run it up and energize that receptacle utilizing that existing circuit. So now the new circuits work as a microwave, mini fridge and small appliance circuit, lighting and receptacles, a package terminal heat pump dedicated circuit, and then we still have the garbage disposal. Now, other potential options here, uh, we could have utilized a smart splitter slash circuit share. We could have done like a, we could have split the circuit for the garbage disposal and the small appliance. Um, the catch there is that we'd have to provide uh, tenant education there around, you can't run your garbage disposal when you're running your blender. So there could be some challenges there. Um, in addition, uh, you know, there could be alternatives in the future, right, as well, if, if we're having issues with the microwave, mini fridge, and uh, people are plugging in their blender, and we're, and we're uh, flipping that breaker quite often, we could sort of move forward with that smart splitter slash circuit share, share device in the future. And so, um, really, this is just to illustrate some of the, uh, some of the exceptions and alternatives that you can do in, mul in specific to multifamily due to sort of the unique types of buildings we have, the types of units we have, and utilizing what's available in the electrical code to avoid costly electrical upgrades and achieve full electrification. Next slide, please. And that is it.